Some of my British viewers have probably already heard of the Yorkshire Ripper, a serial killer who murdered 13 women between 1975 and 1980. Netflix is actually doing a documentary on him which should be out by the time this is uploaded. I'm filming this before it's out but I'm going to watch it as soon as it comes out and then go back and add anything in if I've missed anything noteworthy. So hopefully this will be a pretty detailed but not too long summary of events. If you enjoy mysteries, true crime, disappearances and the occasional conspiracy, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I've also got a Patreon so if you're interested in supporting the channel and accessing some bonus content, a link will be in the description. On the 20th of January 1976, the body of 42-year-old Emily Jackson was found in Leeds with what looked like hammer blows to the back of the head and multiple stab wounds elsewhere on her body. The stab wounds were described as cross-shaped and looked like they could have been caused with a crosshead screwdriver rather than a knife. It seemed that the killer had stamped on her thigh as there was an imprint of a boot. Emily became a prostitute with her husband's approval when their business wasn't doing so well. She had a family to feed and, like some other women at the time, felt like this was her only option. The circumstances surrounding this murder were similar to those of the murder of Wilma McCann, a 28-year-old prostitute who was killed on the 30th of October 1975. She also lived in Leeds and was a mother of four. She had been struck twice with a hammer and stabbed 15 times in the neck, chest and abdomen. On the 9th of May 1976, 20-year-old Marcella Claxton was walking home from a party in Leeds and accepted a lift from a man she didn't know. She needed the toilet so they stopped along the way but as she got out of the car the man hit her from behind with a hammer. She actually survived the attack however she had been four months pregnant at the time and this had caused her to miscarry. She had to undergo multiple extensive brain operations and suffered from intermittent blackouts and chronic depression. By this point it was already pretty clear that there was a serial killer preying on women. The press had already named him the Yorkshire Ripper after Jack the Ripper, a serial killer who was never caught after murdering women, mostly prostitutes, in London in the 1800s. After examining the bodies and the evidence, some experts believed that the killings were not sadistic in nature. There was no clear signs that the Ripper had taken pleasure in these killings but it did seem to come from a place of anger. Because Marcella survived, she could possibly identify her killer. Maybe this threw the Ripper off a little bit as he didn't attack again until nine months later on the 5th of February 1977. Irene Richardson, a prostitute in Leeds, was murdered with a hammer and then her corpse was mutilated. Tire tracks were left at the scene which resulted in a long list of possible suspects but it didn't really go anywhere. On the 23rd of April, Patricia Atkinson was murdered in her flat in Bradford. A boot print was found on the bedding that matched the print found on Emily Jackson's thigh, but like the other clues, this one didn't end up leading anywhere either. The next victim was 16-year-old Jane MacDonald, whose body was found in a playground in Leeds by two children. Up until now, the Ripper's victims had all been prostitutes. Maybe there was a specific reason for this, or maybe they were just easy targets, in the sense that he could easily lure them into his car under false pretenses. Sadly, due to public perception of sex workers, it's also likely that people just wouldn't care as much if one of these women were murdered. Some people even thought they deserved it. But Jane was an exception. She was not a sex worker and was also younger than the other victims. Jane's murder terrified women in the Leeds and Bradford areas, many of whom had convinced themselves they were safe if they weren't prostitutes, but this murder had shown that anyone could be targeted, no matter who they were. It changed the lives and routines of women in the area who were now scared to walk home alone at night. The police even received many calls from women who suspected their own husbands might be the killer. They were, understandably, extremely paranoid and became wary of any men in their lives, with some even analysing the husband's behaviour and becoming worried at any small changes or inconsistencies in the routines. My mum lived in the area when the Ripper was on the loose, only around four miles away from where one of the attacks happened, so I spoke to her and asked her what life was like back then. She said that things were different, that women tried to avoid being out alone, particularly at night but really at any time because no one had any idea when the Ripper was going to strike next. Laundrettes in the area were often open till late at night at that point so women would often sit in there if they had some time to kill just to avoid being out alone on the streets. Rumours and stories were rife with people claiming that they'd seen the Ripper or that he'd pulled up in a car next to them. Obviously most of these were just stories but it undoubtedly caused even more worry for women in the area. 
All that said though, she still tried not to let the situation put her life on hold. She still went out and saw friends even though the worry was always in the back of her mind, but she just took precautions to try and be as safe as she possibly could be. News reports on the Yorkshire Ripper increased significantly after Jane's murder. The next month, the Ripper attacked Maureen Long in Bradford. She survived because he was interrupted, but she was suffering from hypothermia and spent nine weeks in hospital. A witness told police the make of his car, so police checked thousands of cars hoping to find the suspect, though it turned out the witness had misidentified the car. Jean Jordan would be the next victim, murdered in Manchester on the 1st of October 1977. It's believed that the Ripper chose Manchester for his next attack to throw off the police, as the last murder attempt had been unsuccessful and there had been a witness. The Ripper attempted to remove Jean's head, but didn't manage to completely decapitate her. It was later revealed that he had given her a £5 note before murdering her, and after leaving the scene, he worried that the note could be traced back to him. So he went back to the scene after attending a party with family and tried to locate the note. He wasn't able to, so instead chose to try and throw the police off by decapitating Jean. Her body wasn't found for eight days and was actually found by Bruce Jones, an actor who played Les Battersby in Coronation Street, if you've ever seen that. He was even considered a suspect for a little while and sadly lost his marriage as a result of this. Police found the £5 note that was given to Jean by the Ripper and this actually allowed them to narrow their field of inquiry down to 8,000 people and later to 300 people who may have possessed the note at some point but they weren't able to find out exactly who might have given the note to Jean. They interviewed 5,000 men in the next three months including a 31-year-old man named Peter Sutcliffe who lived in Bradford. Sutcliffe was reportedly a loner and left school aged 15, after which he worked a series of low-skilled jobs, including grave digging. Some sources state that he was fired from his grave digging job after he was found to be stealing possessions from the corpses. I'm not sure if Sutcliffe himself ever actually hired prostitutes, sources vary, but he did develop a habit of voyeurism and spent a lot of time spying on prostitutes with their clients. When police questioned Sutcliffe, they believed the alibi he gave was credible, so at that point they didn't really consider him a suspect. However, as anyone familiar with the case will know, it would later turn out that Sutcliffe was in fact the Yorkshire Ripper and that the police had just unknowingly allowed him to continue murdering. The Ripper continued to attack and murder women. On the 14th of December, Marilyn Moore from Leeds survived an attack and was able to help create a composite image and give a description of the vehicle the man drove. Sutcliffe was interviewed again, but released without charge. Yvonne Pearson was murdered in Bradford in January 1978, then Helen Ritker 10 days later in Huddersfield. Next was Vera Millward on the 16th of May in the car park of Manchester Royal Infirmary. On the 4th of April 1979, Josephine Whittaker was murdered in Halifax when she was walking home. Forensic evidence was found at this scene, though police seemed too preoccupied with other supposed pieces of evidence to fully investigate this. The Ripper had sent letters to George Oldfield, who was in charge of the investigation, as well as to the Daily Mirror. The letters were signed Jack the Ripper and were a way of taunting the police. Not long after, a tape recording was sent to the police, again taunting them, but this was actually great for the investigation. The man had a distinctive Geordie accent, which narrowed down the list of suspects significantly. Police spent quite some time now looking for a man with that accent, with writing styles that matched the letters and who fit the description given by survivors. However, it turned out that the effort was wasted when the letters and recording turned out to be a hoax. John Samuel Humble, who was found to be responsible for the hoax in 2005, was sentenced to eight years in prison for perverting the course of justice. In July 1979, Sutcliffe was again questioned by the police in his home with his wife present after his vehicle had been spotted numerous times in the red light district in Leeds, Bradford and Manchester. The officers who conducted the interview weren't entirely convinced by Sutcliffe's explanation and Andrew Laptu, a detective, noted that he lacked personality and wouldn't give any information beyond what he was specifically asked. He didn't have enough to charge him with anything, but he did file a report to his senior officers suggesting that they look further into Sutcliffe as he had a bad feeling about him. One thing that the detective noticed was that Sutcliffe had a gap between his two front teeth, which could have possibly matched bite marks found on the bodies of the two victims. He also told his senior officers that Sutcliffe matched the composite sketches, but they didn't seem interested in that and even got angry when this was suggested. Andrew didn't realise that Sutcliffe had already been questioned four times at this point and his colleagues were so sure that their suspect had a Geordie accent that they didn't really want to pursue Sutcliffe as a suspect. 
There were huge problems with the investigation that undoubtedly allowed Sutcliffe to get away with his crimes for longer than he should have. There was a lack of communication between investigators and poor collection and storage of evidence. Sutcliffe had actually been interviewed nine times in total, but each time the investigators that interviewed him didn't realise how many times he'd been questioned before. This was way back in the 70s, when all evidence, suspect lists, interview notes and anything else the police knew were all written down on paper. Had today's technology been available back then, maybe the Ripper would have been caught much sooner. But alas, he continued his killing spree, with the next victim being 20-year-old Barbara Leach on the 1st of September in Bradford. Like Jim MacDonald, Barbara wasn't a prostitute and because of this, the public and the police took her murder more seriously. Still at the time not realising the letters and voice recording was a hoax, Barbara's murder prompted the police to push an expensive publicity campaign emphasising the accent in the recording. In April 1980, Peter Sutcliffe was arrested for drunk driving and while awaiting trial, he killed two women and attacked three more. 47-year-old Marguerite Walls had been hit on the back of the head on the 20th of August, but this time the Ripper's method changed and he also strangled her. I read a few articles and watched a couple of documentaries and didn't see any suggestions as to why his method changed for Marguerite, but I do have my own personal theory which we'll get back to later. Three more women were also attacked in this time, Uphadja Bandara on the 24th of September, Maureen Leah on the 25th of October, and 16-year-old Teresa Sykes on the 5th of November. Thankfully, these women survived, however, the psychological damage was significant. Teresa no longer felt safe in her home and placed a wardrobe and dressing table against her bedroom door and slept with a knife under her pillow. Jacqueline Hill would be the Ripper's next and final victim. She was killed on the 17th of November, 1980. On the 25th of November, Trevor Birdsall, a man who knew Sutcliffe, actually reported him to the police, suspecting that he might be the Yorkshire Ripper. But this information just got buried along with other mountains of paperwork. Luckily, before the Ripper could claim any more victims, a chance encounter led to his arrest. On the 2nd of January 1981, the police stopped Sutcliffe in his car with a 24-year-old prostitute, Olivia Reavers, in Sheffield. A police check revealed that his car had fake number plates, so he was taken to the Dewsbury police station, where he was again questioned in relation to the murders. This was because he matched the description and the composite sketches that had been drawn up by the victims and witnesses. No weapons were found on him, but when police returned to the scene of the arrest the next day, they found a rope, a hammer and a knife that Sutcliffe had discarded when he went round the corner to pee. They also realised he had hidden a knife in the toilet cistern when he'd been to the toilet at the police station. According to Wikipedia, when Sutcliffe was stripped at the police station, he was wearing an inverted v-neck sweater under his trousers. The sleeves had been pulled up over his legs and the v-neck exposed his genital area. The fronts of the elbows were padded to protect his knees as presumably he knelt over his victim's corpses. The sexual implications of this outfit were considered obvious, but it was not made public until the 2003 publication of the book Wicked Beyond Belief, The Hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper by Michael Bilton. After two days of intense questioning, Peter Sutcliffe suddenly confessed and admitted that he was in fact the Yorkshire Ripper. He calmly described each of the attacks shortly after. Weeks later, he started claiming that God had told him to murder these women, telling police that the women he killed were filth and that he was just cleaning the place up a bit. Sadly, it seemed like he wasn't the only one who felt like this. It was undeniable that the police, and even the public, only really started to care after the murder of Jane MacDonald. Which is really just awful, no matter what your view on prostitution is, to believe that these women deserved it or they were better off dead because of what they did for a living is just so heartless. Sutcliffe only ever expressed remorse when talking about Jane MacDonald, his youngest victim. Some believe Sutcliffe was mentally ill because he said God told him to murder the women, but others just think this was an excuse so he could be found not guilty due to mental illness. A prison guard even claimed to overhear Sutcliffe talking to his wife, saying that he was going to pretend to be mentally ill. Experts believe that the reason behind the killings and behind Sutcliffe's apparent hatred for women came from when he found out his mother had cheated on his father. Growing up, he was closer to his mother than his father, but in 1969, his father found out that she had cheated on him and called the whole family to confront her. Sutcliffe despised his mother for doing this, and it was later that year that he first ever assaulted a prostitute. After an argument over money, he was questioned by the police, but the woman chose not to press charges. It may not have been realised at the time, but before Sutcliffe's first murder victim, and after the attack just mentioned, there were three other attacks on women. 
Anna Rajolsky, Olive Smelt and Tracy Brown, who was just 14. Sutcliffe refused to confess to the attack on Tracy until years after his conviction. All that time, Tracy spent worrying her attacker was still out there. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm very interested in the subject and I've got an A-level in it, but that's about the extent of my education in psychology. So I'm definitely not an expert, but I mentioned earlier that I had a loose theory on the murder of Marguerite Walls. If you compare a photo of her and Sutcliffe's mother, they do look similar. Not identical, but similar enough that I wondered if Sutcliffe might have seen a resemblance in her, and that might have been why his method changed. A murderer's modus operandi can often reveal things about the killer, the nature of the killing, and the reasons behind it. Strangulation is quite an intimate method of killing. We know that Sutcliffe used a rope rather than his hands, which is slightly less so, but it still could suggest a more personal reason. His usual method of killing, striking victims on the head with a hammer and then stabbing them to death, is quite a violent way of doing so. And even if he hadn't have admitted himself, would have shown that he had quite a hatred for women for whatever reason. Stabbing someone multiple times can show that the murderer was taking anger out on the victim. Marguerite was still hit with the hammer, but I wonder if his choice to strangle her rather than stab her was partly because it was a more intimate method, but also partly because despite the anger he held towards his mother, he still couldn't have brought himself to stab her to death. If he did see any resemblance of his mother in Marguerite, that murder specifically could have been symbolic. But that's just my thoughts, it's also possible he just wanted to try out a new method for whatever reason. If anyone watching this is a psychologist, I'd be really interested to hear your take in the comments. It was also suggested that Sutcliffe's wife's attitude towards him was another reason behind his hatred for women. Some articles have suggested that in his mind he was really just killing his wife over and over again. Sutcliffe's wife was apparently emotionally cold and distant and didn't pay much attention to Sutcliffe. Their marriage was more like an arrangement than a loving relationship. She had previously been diagnosed with schizophrenia and according to some sources had claimed she heard the voice of God before, so maybe that's where Sutcliffe got the idea. At his trial, he pled not guilty to 13 charges of murder, but guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, claiming he was carrying out God's will. He pled guilty to seven charges of attempted murder. After four psychiatrists diagnosed Sutcliffe with paranoid schizophrenia, the prosecution intended to accept the plea, however the judge rejected this and insisted the case should be dealt with by a jury. The jury found him guilty of murder on all counts, and he was sentenced to 20 concurrent sentences of life imprisonment. They didn't believe he was suffering with paranoid schizophrenia and didn't accept it as an excuse for the murders. The general public seemed to agree for the most part. You could question how four psychiatrists might have diagnosed him wrong, but studies have shown in the past that this wouldn't actually be too difficult. Psychologists, psychiatrists and other doctors can all be fooled by patients who claim to have symptoms that they don't. Because many different types of mental illness simply rely on a patient telling a doctor what their symptoms are, it basically just relies on whether or not they believe the patient. There's no way that anyone can really say whether or not Suckley felt that God was communicating with him. We can pretty confidently say that God was not communicating with him, but there's no way to say what he felt, because the only person that knows that is him. So diagnoses of mental illness are not always 100% reliable if a person lies, because there's no way to know if they're lying or not. Sutcliffe was attacked a few times by fellow inmates during his time in prison. In 1983, a broken coffee jar was plunged into his face, resulting in him needing 30 stitches. In March the next year, he was sent to Broadmoor Hospital after being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. A few years later, his wife divorced him. A convicted robber at the hospital attempted to strangle him with the cable from a pair of headphones. The next year, an inmate stabbed him with a pen and he lost the vision in his left eye. His right eye was severely damaged. In 2007, another inmate tried to blind him completely by lunging at him with a knife, but he dodged and was stabbed in the cheek. After a few years of debating whether or not Sutcliffe had recovered and was fit to return to prison to complete his sentence, he was finally transferred to prison in 2016. Before he was sent to prison, he actually made friends with Jimmy Savile. I'm sure you've probably heard of this man and I'm not going to go into detail on what he did in this video. If you're not aware, research with caution. Some people believe that Sutcliffe and Savile were actually friends before they met at the hospital and that Savile may have even been an accomplice. As far as I could tell, there's no solid evidence to suggest this, but there are a few coincidences, such as Irene Richardson being murdered very close to Savile's penthouse and other attacks also happening near him. 
Even if Savile didn't help Sutcliffe kill his victims, it's very likely that Sutcliffe knew Savile's secrets and likely took many of them to the grave. On the 13th of November 2020, at the age of 74, Sutcliffe died after treatment for a suspected heart attack two weeks prior. He had a number of underlying health conditions and tested positive for coronavirus, which is thought to have contributed to his death. Some of the victims' families were happy he was gone, but others thought he had an easy way out. While we only know Sutcliffe for his awful crimes, it's easy to assume what kind of person he might have been, but many people who knew him were very shocked to find out that he was guilty of the murders. His younger brother has since appeared in documentaries and claimed that he would have never suspected Sutcliffe. His colleagues all said the same thing. My dad even knew a woman who used to go drinking with Sutcliffe in Bingley and said that he was the nicest person you could ever meet. It's a pretty scary thought that there's often no way to tell apart these people from the rest of the population. I mean, think of the nicest person that you know. Now imagine you were told that they were a serial killer. How shocked would you be? It just goes to show that you never really know anyone and sometimes the people that come across the nicest or the most harmless can actually be some of the most dangerous people on the earth. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Did I leave anything out or do you have any other points to add, especially regarding the psychology of the Ripper? If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing and checking out my Patreon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.